Hi, everybody. I uh, hope you can hear me well. So good afternoon and um, and good morning to you all, uh, depending on where you're joining from. And thank you for being with us today to discuss um, the IEA detailed uh, energy consumption data. I'm Thomas Algozi, um, working in the team responsible for energy NUCs and demand data and efficiency indicators built with the relevant activity data. We'll now explore uh, what can uh, get from understanding the demand side of the energy system uh, and the analysis that can be done with detailed data and also touch upon how they can be collected. So here's the agenda. A quick note though, uh, you'll see that some of the data presented here might be not uh, the most up-to-date. It is often because COVID had such an impact on consumption patterns. So to give you the general idea, best was to use the pre-COVID data. Please feel free to ask, as we said, any question either today or later via email. So let's start with why we need to look at the demand side of the energy system beyond the sectoral level and the analysis that we can do if we have them. So first, as for a budget, the energy system is a complex uh, set of intertwined flows. Here we have incoming energy flows on the left, like revenues in a budget, and outgoing flows on the right, like expenditure. To manage a budget, you need to study both the input and the output. So here we'll need to look at the details of how we consume energy, the output side, and you've been working on the input side in previous days. Uh, at the IEA's Energy Data Center, we like to split energy consumption into four main sectors. Industry that covers manufacturing and other industries like mining. We also have services, residential uh, uh, sector, and the transport sector. Uh, in the IEA countries, uh, transport is the most consuming sector with more than one third of consumption. This comes then comes industry with about a, th a fourth, and then buildings, residential buildings with about 20% and services for 15%. So as you can see, no sector can be left behind. They all weight a significant part. And uh, note that these share vary greatly, in particular, depending on industrial development versus uh, services maturity or on transport, depending on the country's size, obviously, things like this. Uh, we may wonder, though, what are the underlying details of this consumption? Which parts of the economy is the most sensitive to price, for instance, or to energy supply disruptions? Which subsectors are efficient and which ones need a bit more help to improve? Which sectors we need to focus on regarding emissions as well? For all of this, we need to go further down the rabbit hole into the details. One of the most important analyses that we do is about energy security. With enough data, we can see which NUCs are the most reliant on some fuels and which impact uh, any disruption may have on them. It helps derive uh, policies about supply, of course, but also about sobriety and efficiency, about te technological deployment, or even just uh, about infrastructures and their maintenance. It may have deep consequences depending on the past policies. An important point is that climate roadmaps and other environmental targets can be achieved only with control over our energy spending. Here is a graph from the new update of the IEA Net Zero 2050 Roadmap, a major analysis from the IEA. We can see how much each mitigation measure on the right contributes to the net zero target. If you look carefully, you will see that they almost all depend on the demand side of the system because we have lifestyles impact, that is demand. Then we have efficiency, which is demand side again. Then we have a number of fuel switches. That is how the tools that we use and consume one fuel will be adapted to consume something else. And then we have CCUS. So the fine understanding of energy consumption is a key aspect to manage the energy system. Uh, these uh, lead many countries to build and track energy consumption and efficiency strategies, whether they're called action plan or program or else. Uh, some focus on renewables, some other on efficiency, others on data management systems, and so on. They are all based on some kind of data collection as the foundation of the policy analysis. Uh, also, as energy permeates all aspects of our daily lives, a key analysis is energy expenditure. That is how much money is spent on our energy consumption and which share it represents in our final budget. In Western Europe, uh, 2022 has been an important year uh, as several energy products prices spiked. 
It implied strong policy responses. So tracking the impact of such policies required good data sets of energy consumption data by end uses and by fuels, along with prices data. And finally, uh, another very interesting analysis that we can perform with enough data is the composition analysis, in which the energy consumption trend is split into three main factors, the activity, the structure, and the efficiency. This analysis helps understand the driving force of the energy consumption and design efficient policies, for instance, on investments, on infrastructure, and on transportation modes. We'll dig into this later with an example. So now let's look at the IEA's uh, data collection on energy consumption and efficiency indicators. The IEA decided at the 2009 Governing Board meeting at ministerial level to collect detailed end use consumption data annually. This, ac this action plan uh, ad approved at the meeting, including uh, the objective to promote energy efficiency. So end use data and statistics need to be collected annually to develop and track consumption patterns and efficiency indicators. The IEA, in concert with international experts, develop a questionnaire template based on a robust and harmonized methodology. This includes also internal, internal consistency and comparison checks that we perform handing down with our counterparts in the institutions that are providing us with the data to ensure data quality and uh, assist when issues arise. So recall that an efficiency indicator is defined as the ratio of energy consumption by some related activity data. The basis of the IES methodology can be summed up with this pyramid graph. The top of the pyramid shows very aggregated indicators, such as the energy intensity of the whole economy. It's an interesting proxy to compare the trends of various countries, for instance, but it doesn't give many insights for policy decision. The further down one goes, the more data one needs, with subsectoral and end use data, along with the related activity data, so for instance, the ton of good produced or the number of square meters of housing that you need to heat. Um, one can identify the focus point for improvements, whether through investments, technological upgrades, social measures, and so on. So the IEA's Energy End Use and Efficiency Indicators database gathers energy consumption data split by end uses, such as basic metals for industry or space heating in buildings but also by fuels such as gas and oil and electricity, and also sometimes more detailed oil products in the transport sector, for instance. We also collect related sectoral activity uh, uh, to, building, to build indicators, such as um, value added for commercial sectors, the number of dwellings in residential or vehicle commerce in the transport sector. We provide the uh, indicators themselves that we compute with all these. And finally, when enough data is available, as I said, we perform the energy decomposition analysis and the carbon decomposition analysis. Uh, this very detailed database covers uh, 31 member countries, five association countries, three accession, and 22 countries beyond the IA family. Um, that is almost 2 billion people. So um, with um, a lot more uh, with countries from uh, every part of the world and hoping to uh, go uh, always a bit beyond. Uh, we wish to include uh, as many country and cover uh, a largest population possible. And we're always working bilaterally with multiple institutions to make this database as representative and complete as possible. So we invite any of you to reach out uh, should you have any question about international methodologies to discuss how we can assist you on data collections or sharing experiences from other countries. Note though that pretty much no country has data about everything, uh, but often data is first collected in, on the most important sector and then expands. So my colleagues tell me that uh, should be better with this. I hope that you can hear me well. Uh, please let me know if it's uh, not the case. Um, <clears throat> so coming back to this, um, yes, from all of these data collected, uh, the IA Energy Data Center compiles a large database available on our webpage. 
to make it user-friendly, the main publication in Excel provides all the data as well as a set of interactive graphs and visualization tools to assist the analysis. This full database is also available in IVT format. And we also provide two samples, the highlights and the demo and availability files in Excel 2. Another way to browse our data is the Data Explorer uh, with a web interface to produce the graphs. And finally, we maintain documentation with methodology and detailed content notes, as well as two manuals on statistics and policy making. Uh, we'll add now in the chat a link to the web page and to the manuals. So I'll now dig into the sectoral methodology, uh, providing examples of data and indicators. So uh, starting with industry, uh, we have, uh, as as I said before, we have two types of data, the energy consumption and the activity data. In the industry sector, the energy consumption is split by subsector for following the uh, international uh, classification called ISIC. Uh, and the activity data, we have two types of activity data, the physical production output, such as the ton of steel or the ton of cement, for instance, and we have value added. Uh, here are for a selection of countries, the six most consuming subsectors. Each of them use different fuels with general trends, but also country specificities. So for instance, chemicals often depend on gas, while wood and paper may, be used, may use significant amount of biofuels and waste. Basic metal is an interesting example. Uh, it may rely mainly on fossil fuels or on electricity, depending on technology choices. So tracking this split allows to anticipate the impact of policies and regulations. It's also essential, obviously, for the energy security analysis, especially for subsectors depending mainly on one energy product. Uh, so as I said, we can make two types of indicator. One is per value added, the other one is per physical output. The one per value added requires harmonized value added data using, for instance, deflators and purchasing power parity but they're good to compare uh, sectors, countries, and follow trends. The per physical output uh, indicator requires careful methodology, especially on trade of intermediate products, such as clinker in the case of cement. But they are helpful to avoid currency issues, obviously, and they're excellent at plant level or to track technology deployment. Um, Following on with the services, so the energy consumption can be split in two ways. Either we follow the building point of view, so we split um, using end uses such as uh, space heating or lighting, but we can also split the energy consumption of the sector using the um, commercial point of view, that is the, uh, the the economical point of view, and then we split following the subsector categories of Isaac again. And then activity data, we have value added as for um, industry. And we have also things which relate more to uh, the building point of view that are the services floor area or the number of employees. So uh, we usually categorize the services activity into 11 subsectors. Here, uh, about half of the energy uh, consumption is covered by only three subsectors, administrative services, um, health and social work, and retail. Uh, but the weight of each subsector in energy terms might not relate to its output expressed in value added in this case. For instance, accommodation and food services provide little wealth but consume 10% of the services energy. The energy efficiency indicators here would be in megajoules per USD PPPs, and it shows that the um, finance and other administrative activities have significantly lower intensity than accommodation and food services. Alternatively, if we look at the indicator per floor area, it shows lower intensity for the accommodation and food services with respect to wholesale and retail trade, for instance. So in all this is to show that a careful analysis of the data is needed to identify which indicators makes the most sense to assist the policy making. Moving on to residentials, we have only the building point of view with um, end uses such as space heating, space cooling. We'll also add things like cooking and appliances energy consumption. The activity data relates to the building themselves, so the number of occupied dwellings, for instance, the residential floor area, uh, the population as well, 
and also specific data about appliances like the stock. For residential consumption by end uses and fuels, one can see the influence of the climate. For instance, we see here little space heating is needed in Morocco. And we know as well uh, that the share and fuel uh, and fuel split, sorry, for, for cooking is very dependent uh, on the lifestyle, such as habit of eating out, cooking methods, and types of stoves. The fuel split is of most consuming end uses are central to understand the reliance on imports, the impact of price variations, the designs of emission and efficiency programs, as well as health-related issues such as indoor pollution. Note that we can correct the energy consumption for space heating and space cooling to better track the trend using indicators of the weather of that year. This is called temperature correction or weather correction. It allows to remove the impact of a particularly cold or a particularly hot year on the energy consumption. And you can refer to our documentation for more details. And finally, on the transport sector, uh, this is where we need the, the most activity data. So the energy consumption data can be split by segment uh, with freight versus passenger, as well as by mode, road, air, rail, and, trans and, and water transport. Road passenger transport can be split further by vehicle types, for instance, between passenger car, buses, and motorcycles. Road freight transport and rail transport can also be split by vehicle type, depending on the importance of these modes and segments. Um, and the needed activity data encompasses many different kinds of data. We have vehicle stocks. We have the distance traveled by vehicles, which we merge into uh, vehicle kilometers, VKM. And we have the vehicle loads, which is computed into PKM and TKM, as we'll see now. So we have, um, as I said, the stock, and you multiply it by the, dis the average distance travel by uh, your stock. Uh, alternatively, you can sum up for each vehicle the distance travel, um, but it's often uh, more tedious if you have a large fleet. And then you multiply this by the average occupancy. It gives you for a passenger kilometer um, an idea of how many passengers traveled and on the distance they traveled uh, using these um, these vehicles types. If we split uh, already into uh, the four main modes, we have here the data for the IA countries. Uh, road takes up more than 90% of the consumption. Then by fuel, we see that oil products account for the overwhelming majority um, of consumption, 98%, and even within the oil products, two, gasoline and diesel, represent a huge part. But what about the split between passenger and freight? That is how much is consumed by cars versus trucks. Was a typical distance covered depending on the vehicle types, the load factor, how it differs from between countries. So, quick example just on this um, activity data: we have here Korea and the United States, and we can see that the um, the share of cars for activity is a lot larger in the USA than in Korea. This may explain consumption patterns or show differences in efficiency in habits or simply in the usage of care of cars. Uh, I'll skip here this slide on decomposition. We can uh, talk about it later in questions if we if you want. So let's have a quick tour to the IEA tools uh, regarding how to collect data, uh, as this is no simple task. First, we call that gathering and estimating energy consumption by end use at national level and developing efficiency indicators can be very challenging. It requires the right resources at national level and the support of the international and regional key entities. In general, data collections can be categorized into four main methods. We have administrative sources, which are often the pre-existing basis, which needs to be gathered. The issue here are often to do with institutional arrangement and methodological alignment. Surveys, where one goes to get the data directly at the source. This is costly, but very effective to look at uh, specific issues. Measuring is very powerful once in place, but needs dedicated equipment and careful use. They cover limited end uses, but they get very robust data. And finally, modeling, which requires some solid data to be built on and expertise, but it allows to bridge gap or transform, for instance, case, car sales into car stocks. We call again that before any of these, always check what data exists already in other institutions to see what you actually need to add to them. 
So for commercial activity, that is the industry and services, a great basis of information can be found through economic authorities, such as Chamber of Commerce, regulation authorities, or tax reports. Complemented with energy company data and sales reports, these sectors often already collect significant amount of data for themselves. The main trick is to gather them and ensure the methodological consistency. Buildings are often requiring the most varied data sources, whether residential building or services from an end-use point of view. With basic activity data such as population, employment, dwellings and floor area, covered usually by administrative sources, most energy consumption data relies on the combination of service and measuring in best case. Modeling uh, allows to avoid repeating service too often as well. And finally, in the transport sector, many data exist from oil consumption to car sales or registrations, but this needs some manipulation, if not modeling, to obtain the data split by mode and vehicle type. So usually surveys are also needed to provide the basis for model calibration and complement where data is lacking. So these were the main ideas, but of course, uh, every country, every sector is different. Uh, and the truth is, other countries' experiences are incredibly valuable resources when one needs to collect new data. That is why the IA gathered online numerous data collection practices, and we welcome any other that you may have and want to share with us. Um, and we provide their uh, documentation, survey samples, reports from many countries around the world and covering a, a huge diversity of situation. So we hope that you can find uh, interesting uh, insight from this data collection. Uh, to complement and strengthen this framework, the IA developed a guide uh, to build national roadmaps. It aims first at helping countries locating their departure point and to identify the targets according to national interests and priorities. In addition, buildings, uh, building on, on countries' experiences, again, it assists professionals and decision makers when willing to develop and use uh, data collections and efficiency indicators, this guide is, is made to provide a generic method acknowledging the contextual differences. International collaborations are crucial to speed up the learning process and keep up with the pace of technological, economic, and geopolitical change. And finally, this is still work in progress, but we still wanted to present it, the IEA uh, commitment to build capacity in any country looking for assistance. And in addition to the roadmap guide, we are currently developing a toolkit to estimate disaggregated data. The idea is to provide a simple, adaptable tool to model and use data from more commonly available data. One typical example uh, is splitting residential energy into the different end uses, such as space heating, cooking, and so on. So feel free, again, to reach out to us for any of these resources. And with this in mind, I thank you very much for your attention, and please feel free to comment or question any part of the presentation. Thanks.